Hi, we're going to be talking about violence and sexual violence in this series. There's also some strong language. Please take care while listening. All rise. I'm calling the case People State of California versus Joseph James D'Angelo. The defendant will plead guilty to 13 counts of first degree murder. The defendant will say, I admit to all the uncharged offenses that have been alleged. Do you understand the terms of this plea, Mr. D'Angelo? Yes, you are. Welcome back to the official companion podcast of HBO's All Be Gone in the Dark. I'm your host, Nancy Miller. Before we get into today's episode, we have a special update on the case against the Golden State Killer suspect, Joseph James D'Angelo. He was arrested back in 2018, and on June 29th, 2020, there was an important hearing. So let's check in with one of the documentary's filmmakers, Elizabeth Wolfe, about last week's proceedings. So I'm going to set the scene. We're not in a courthouse, but in a ballroom at Cal State Sacramento. Because of COVID-19, this is where Joseph James D'Angelo finally must face the survivors of his crimes in a plea hearing. We're going to get into what it felt like to be in that room in a future episode. But for now, Elizabeth, can you tell us what happened in that converted courtroom? Oh, gosh. We watched a hearing that was over five hours. And each one of the prosecutors from the different counties, I lost count after a while, got up and read from the case files many descriptions of each one of the murders, each one of the rapes, and read through each one of the charges and made him either plead guilty to the ones that he was charged with or take responsibility for the crimes that he was not charged with because of a statute of limitations. He basically said three things. He said yes, he said guilty, he said I admit over and over again for five hours. And P.S., the way that he said it is not like how you and I are saying it. He said it in this halting, feeble, high-pitched whisper. Yeah, he seemed like a shell of a human being. I noticed a couple of times he was even falling asleep. I don't think that he really was listening. I am not buying his whole old man shtick for a second. (laughs) For starters... Didn't the prosecutor also say something about D'Angelo riding around on a motorcycle like four days before he was arrested? That was something that Paul Holes and a number of the investigators that were tailing D'Angelo in the weeks leading up to his arrest observed him bombing down the highway on his motorcycle and fixing his boat in his garage and doing like very heavy lifting healthy things. I mean, this was a guy who, for all of his 72 years when he was arrested, really actually seemed like 15 years younger. He was in really, really good health. He had just retired. And as soon as he was arrested, he basically feigned incoherence again. When D'Angelo was arrested in 1979, apparently he also feigned an illness. He pretended that he was having a heart attack And so he has this history of feigning incoherence. So when you look at this guy who looks like he is suffering from dementia and that his mind isn't there, it's not true. We know that he is completely cognizant. He knows what he's done. And that was something that the prosecutors really made a point of saying early on, like, you're going to watch him and he is going to be putting on this act. You've obviously done a ton of research on the case, but Is there anything that surprised you in this hearing? Like anything that you heard that you didn't know about before? There were a couple of things in this hearing that were new pieces of information. One early on, the prosecutor described after D'Angelo's arrest in 2018, he was put in a interrogation room and left alone where they recorded him talking to himself and referring to this alter ego named Jerry and admitting that he committed these crimes, saying, I did all those things, I've destroyed all their lives, and now I've got to pay the price. And that is the closest we've come to hearing him acknowledge what he's done. 
That was really, really interesting. Another one was that the prosecutors had interviewed a high school friend of D'Angelo's who recounted an incident when D'Angelo, as a high school student, was attacked by a dog. And D'Angelo retaliated by lighting the dog on fire. Another just really creepy detail about his early violent side. As someone who's been following this case for more than two years, what did it feel like for you to watch this hearing? You know, I was mostly focused on the survivors, and there were a couple of news feeds that would pan over to each one of the survivors or victims' families. And as the crime was being read, and as the prosecutors were describing these heinous things, the family members would stand up. So all of these survivors who are listed as Jane Doe 1, Jane Doe 36, Jane Doe 47, would stand up when their case was called. And it was so powerful to see, even from the back of their heads, them standing up and trying to face D'Angelo, that he had to look at them. And there was even one survivor, Jane Carson Sandler. She was actually the first survivor to ever come public in the media. And she got up out of her chair and walked right in front of Joe D'Angelo and stood staring at him. She pulled her mask down because, you know, everyone was wearing a mask. How poetic is that, right? Mm. All of the survivors were wearing masks, but Joe D'Angelo was wearing this clear, transparent plastic cover. And she stared at him. And when the prosecutor read the detail from her case file about how she described him as having a small penis, she put both thumbs up in the air and all the survivors applauded. And then he had to admit to these crimes. It was so powerful. And as much as I have spent immersed in these case files, aware of the details of these crimes, it was really hard to spend all day really listening in a very kind of robotic, clinical way, these prosecutors detail every single violation that this man committed to each one of these people. It was really, really hard. It was eerie because it looks almost like an intergalactic tribunal because it's people with these clear face shields on. And then he's there looking like Emperor Palpatine, like this really like creepy looking old man. And it's over and over the course of hours. And you hear the sickening things that he said, the duration of those assaults mm -hmm. and the abundance of that terror just shook me again. If it's like that for me, for the people in the room, it must have been just a strange, strange experience. Were you feeling like this is a reckoning? You know, I think it will feel like a reckoning during the sentencing phase, which is going to happen on August 17th, when the victim impact statements will be read. I think that that is going to really feel like closure this is certainly the beginning of the end and certainly the beginning of the end for D'Angelo winding his way through the criminal justice system. But I think our eyes have always been really focused on the survivors and their journey and them getting resolution. And I know how important it was for so many of them to be there in person. And I think it will be even more impactful for them to be able to say what they want to say to him next month. Thank you, Elizabeth, for the update. Thank you, Nancy. We'll be hearing even more from you, as well as your series co-director Liz Garbus and My Favorite Murders' Karen Kilgariff, later in this episode, which starts right now. On this week's episode of the documentary series, we see the East Area Rapist behaving more and more violently, and investigators are beginning to worry he'll start killing. What they don't know yet is it turns out he already has. We also see Michelle McNamara dive deeper into the true crime community online and how the darkness of the Golden State Killer case is starting to affect her. What particularly stood out to me was this whole world of true crime. And that's the citizen detectives who helped solve the cases to the obsessive fans who have given this whole genre a revival. This week on the podcast, we will get into all of that with My Favorite Murders' Karen Kilgariff. But first, let's hear from the documentary's filmmakers, Liz Garbus and Elizabeth Wolf, 
about how they embedded into the world of citizen detectives to better understand Michelle, and about the still unsolved case that drew Michelle into a career as a true crime writer. The murder of Kathy Lombardo. Welcome, Liz Garbus. Hi, thanks for having me. And Elizabeth Wolf. Hi. So here we are in episode two. And of course, a lot happened. But something that I'm really thinking about is this point of entry where Michelle is becoming entrenched in the community of citizen detectives. How much did you know about this corner of the internet beforehand, Liz Garbus? Um, I've taken some dips in that pool. Um, So I was aware of this community, not specifically Michelle's in the GSK world, but I have spent a little bit too much time diving into various theories on unsolved crimes. So it was familiar territory to me, although these specific amazing sleuths were not folks I had met already. So yes, I completely identify with the passion and the lost hours. One thing I've been thinking a lot about since watching episode two is how critical the Kathy Lombardo case was to Michelle becoming an investigator and crime writer. And also how she pursued this case for years on her own, but couldn't solve it. So as you were working on this project, did you find you had a similar obsession once you learned about the Kathy Lombardo case? When we started working on this project after reading Michelle's book, we thought maybe we'll figure out who was the the Golden State Killer. And when that mission was accomplished, we thought, you know, the most amazing thing to do would be to reignite interest in Michelle's white whale. That white whale was the first murder case that Michelle remembers being completely transfixed by. She was a teenager growing up in suburban Chicago, Oak Park, and a young woman named Kathy Lombardo went jogging one evening and was brutally murdered. Michelle remembers this quite vividly. She even remembers visiting the crime scene and finding a little piece of Kathy Lombardo's Walkman. What it does show you is how much this got under her skin. The idea that someone's life could just be taken from them and there would never be another sound, never be justice for that family, and that we would never understand. She said the community moved on, but she couldn't. So we thought, gosh, how can we move this forward? You know, maybe with some other citizen sleuths that we're working on this project with, we could move it forward. And HBO and Elizabeth and myself and her whole team were just like, let's go, let's go and try to, you know, walk the streets, do what Michelle would do if she were alive. Unfortunately, we weren't successful, but we do hope that, you know, kind of talking about it here and now and raising it again in the documentary series can help push that case forward. Anything you want to add, Elizabeth? One of the first things we did was, you know, I wrote a letter to Chris Lombardo, her brother. This is a obviously a traumatic thing in his life. So I really wanted to not come out of the blue with a cold call. And so I wrote an old fashioned letter and mailed it snail mail and he got it and he gave me a call. And I remember him saying to me, you know, I just drove my daughter to work. We never talk about my sister, Kathy, but your letter allowed us to have such an important conversation about my sister and her death. And he didn't know anything about Michelle's book, about Michelle's interest in the case, and read the book. And like so many people, victims, family members with unsolved cases, you know, he really had lost a lot of hope. There was a sadness about him. But he said, anything that you want to do to help advance the case, I am supportive of it. And with his cooperation, we contacted Oak Park Police Department again, and we requested the case files. And ultimately, they turned us down because they said, while it was virtually an inactive case, it was still technically an open case, and therefore they could not share the police files. But what they did say, I think because of our attention to this case, they did say that they were sending forensic evidence that they had to a state lab to be tested for DNA. And that was in November 2018. And we had since asked about anything that came of that. They haven't told us. We do know that Illinois has a backlog in terms of their lab. And that's ultimately where we left off. Do you hope that Citizen Sleuths, the people who watch this documentary or whoever else, will pick this case up where you left off? 
all of it, the answer is yes. Like, I mean, I would love to see the energy that people devoted to solving the Golden State Killer, to solving other crimes put into this case for Michelle. You know, I think it would be a really beautiful thing. And of course, more importantly, for the Lombardas. That was Liz Garbus and Elizabeth Wolf. Next up, I talk with my favorite murders, Karen Kilgariff, about how her upbringing led to a fascination with crime, how Michelle McNamara changed true crime forever, and how Karen follows in Michelle's footsteps to subvert the genre. Karen, thank you for joining us. I am really excited to talk to you about the Golden State Killer case, of course, the world of true crime, and your podcast, My Favorite Murder. But let's start with the whole reason we're here recording this podcast in the first place, which is, of course, Michelle McNamara. When were you first introduced to Michelle's blog, True Crime Diary? Well, I became friends with her husband, Patton, when we were 20-year-olds doing stand-up comedy in San Francisco in the early 90s, like 1990. And one of our first bonding things was admitting that we both had a weird interest in serial killers. It was, I remember very distinctly talking about Ed Gein and John Wayne Gacy with him. And it was like one of the first times that I could have a conversation like that in an honest, open way um, and not have anybody recoil or be horrified by what I was saying, which is very much kind of that sensation that I had across the board of being a stand-up comic. It was like I was finally with my tribe. Yeah. Um, so when Patton and Michelle started dating down in Los Angeles 10 years later, one of the first things he told me about her is she's super into true crime and you really need to read her blog. So he was the person that exposed me to it first. And it was such a different kind of tone than really anything I'd interacted with in the 90s. The true crime thing in the 90s it was very different than today. It was it was a little bit more about the killers themselves. It yeah. borderlined on kind of glorifying. It was like when Johnny Depp was buying John Wayne Gacy's paintings. You know what I mean? It had a yes. little more of that focus. Yeah. And True Crime Diary was one of the first things I personally experienced that was much more about the victims, cold cases. It was definitely the focus not so much on these famous kind of legendary cases, which is what I kind of came up on. But this then was much more the citizen detective vibe, which was fascinating to me because it was so incredibly personal. And it was like she herself had this invested interest. I'd never seen anything like that before. And in fact, she made a point of saying, you know, the killers themselves, once they're discovered, aren't that interesting. They're not. In these other cases, it was much more like this is the stuff that you see one small blurb about on page seven of your newspaper. And then what happens to those victims and what happens to those cases and who is going to care about this? When did you two develop a relationship or a friendship? We weren't like call each other on the phone friends. We were like when we would see each other because she and Patton had been married for a while and she would be like backstage at a show. I would get the first hand story from her of how she was getting these different police departments to actually work together. And yeah. I was much more of like a fan and kind of like when I would see her, I'd be like, please tell me every word of everything that you're doing. It was mu it was much more like that. I think I read every single post on that blog at least once. You know, you kind of like, when you read something as personal as someone's blog, you kind of are in their head and you feel like you're in their life, but they are not in your life at all. So I did definitely <laughs> yeah. have that kind of fan-ish vibe with her. Was Michelle your sort of foray into that world? Or were you sort of following the cold case file message boards or following the blog culture before that? No, it was Michelle entirely kind of introduced me to that idea. I did not know those boards existed. I didn't realize people did stuff like that. I don't know, I'm too old. Like when the internet and all those things kind of came up, I always felt like that's for the kids. It's not for me. <laughs> so, and so I kind of didn't understand that there was kind of a more active part that you could take than just watching another episode of City Confidential. And also that idea, like to me, the energy and the dedication and the focus that takes like, it seems like what she was doing and what citizen detectives do 
it's so much more the mathy science part of it. You know what I mean? Like they read records for hours and hours to find one fact and then have to chase down like this button is from, we figured out it's from 1950 and it's from the Navy and it's this kind, I mean, it's amazing, but that's not what I ever feel driven to do. You and your co-host Georgia Hardstark started My Favorite Murder back in 2016. How would you describe the way that you approach true crime in your podcast versus the way that Michelle McNamara did with her true crime blog? It's almost the opposite, I would say. We've compared it to when they do Talking Dead after The Walking Dead, you know, where it's like you've watched the TV show, now you're going to talk about what you watched. George and I met and kind of bonded when The Staircase and The Jinx were both on roughly around that same time. And we were at a party and we started talking about it. Literally everyone left the kitchen and we were the only ones still in there like screaming about who did it and what happened. And when George and I talk about those and continue to talk now about these cases, it is entirely from we don't know what we're talking about. We just know that we're interested. We want to know what happened. We want to see justice done like most people do. But I've never thought to myself, I can solve it, which I think is what was inspirational about True Crime Diary. It was just like, I care and I'm a really good writer and I'm going to make you care because I'm a really good writer. I think she really used her talent in such a beautiful way. So something that Michelle talked a lot about was the Kathy Lombardo case, which was way back from her teen years. But it's the case that got her hooked on this idea of finding out who did it and this idea of solving a puzzle. So what's the case that got you really hooked on following an unsolved crime? I guess for me, I always felt very sheltered as a kid, very kind of like raised in the country, Irish Catholic experience. It's very specific to me. But the very first true crime thing I ever saw was a book about John Wayne Gacy. And I flipped it open and it was the grid of how the bodies were buried in the house. And I was 12, I think. And I stood there staring at it for like 10 minutes because I couldn't wrap my mind around it. And that's when I realized my parents were not telling me anything about what was going on in the real world. They were keeping it from me and I needed to find out because they were never gonna tell me. Like, this is real. And this is what's been kept from me so far. What else don't I know? I like, by the way, that sounds like good parenting, but I understand why that would be a betrayal. (laughs) I was pissed. (laughs) And also, the very first up-close experience was also the East Area Rapist because I went to college in Sacramento. So I lived there. And that story was a legend around town. It was fascinating to live in that city in the late 80s when that was one of the cases that you would see on forensic files. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The fact that it was cold for so long made it this kind of like legend. I definitely had that feeling like, well, he'll never get caught. If he hasn't gotten caught now, he'll never get caught. So knowing the sort of arc of the East Area Rapist, the tracking that Michelle was doing on that case back when he was Iran's, before he was GSK, Did it sort of fall into the category of like, okay, I was in college. That was something that was in a like a sepia toned, distant past. And there were other cases that you were far more interested in because it sounds like you've got almost 300 (laughs) episodes that prove that. Yeah. But what is it about the Golden State Killer, even prior to his capture, that people found so captivating enough that there is this incredible book that she created and now a, a series based on that? I think it's the intensely sinister aspect of how premeditated those attacks were. I remember one time reading how he sometimes would case the houses, and if the family was gone, he would go in and hide, like, rope under the couch cushions. Or as the attacks would go on, people would be doing things like putting pieces of wood in the window so they couldn't be slid open, and then those would be gone. Or he would be sitting under a window for hours at a time. Like, these things that people not realizing. And then when the cops come and point out that, oh, he stole the family photo and some China, it's such a psychological attack on top of being a sexual attack and totally predatory and just bizarre. You know, the dishes on the husband's back, a high-pitched voice. I mean, you couldn't write it. People would say this too much detail. This is crazy, you know. For me, it's the Christmas Day turkey and the decision to go and eat 
Christmas leftovers on the back patio, I think, at the Offerman house. Mm. I think because it went on so long, he didn't get caught. He seemed to have a supernatural ability to get away, to anticipate where the police would be, to jump over fences. Like, because it went on so long, the lore grew. I definitely put him in the top three, at least my personally. But his was so focused on the victims, calling them years later. You have to be so fucked up. It's like, how does a person get to that point where they have victims they have raped and families they have terrorized, and then four years later, they're going to call them on the phone? Yeah, It's stuff like that where it's beyond the pale. It's mind-blowing that a person could be like that. So the sort of cult of personality around Ted Bundy and John Wayne Gacy sort of match the mythology. Creepy clown paintings, Ugh. Ted Bundy and his ability to still develop a cult following. How does the actual Golden State Killer, presumably alleged Joseph D'Angelo, rate in terms of mythology versus man for you? Well, with all those elements to it where he would outrun the police or out, I don't know, bike. Wasn't there one time we got away on a bike? Like... You kind of expect him to seem like an old Olympian or something. And when then when you see that he's just an old guy sitting in a chair and it's just that guy, he looks like he could be at Costco. And that kind of is part of it. He went to Costco. He lived in Citrus Heights. He stayed in the town. He terrorized and didn't get caught and blended in like the world's worst fucking chameleon. Like it's as disturbing and shocking as it is kind of like, oh, that guy. The lore is about this disgusting and horrifying behavior. He himself is nothing. He's nothing. And now he's just an old guy in jail. Something that I've, I've thought about is the toll of consuming unfiltered images. She was seeing things completely raw, unprocessed that a cop would see. I know that you have a podcast that focuses on the sort of cultural exploration of these crimes, but you are nonetheless processing and discussing things, using humor as its own filter. But have you felt any of that kind of like toxic residue that Michelle felt based on some of her difficulties as she was not just finishing a book, which is hard enough, yeah. but having to push through this disgusting, vile material? So that is the hugest weight. And I never look at crime scene photos. I can't because I do a thing if I if something is upsetting enough, I can see it in my head for a very long time. Hmm. And I also can't listen to 911 tapes. Every time I watch a Golden State Killer special, I have to hold the remote to make sure I mute it because those phone calls and the tapes of him, I can't have it in my ears. It's very disturbing. So I try to limit like the sensory intake. And mostly, I try to make it a story, facts and dates, and kind of hooking it up and making it much more about the words and the story and the people and who it's about, as opposed to kind of like setting it out like a case that I have to take every piece of it in. And sometimes I do have to take a break. Like, there's long periods where I'll, I'll watch, like, Rosemary and Time, which is about two, two women who were gardeners who also, everywhere they went, someone would get killed. And so they'd have to solve that, too. And they're the most delightful two women. And it was like... Yeah, it's like menopausal Cagney and yeah, Lacey. Yeah, Br British style. So it's very polite. It's like, someone keeps stealing our plants. And I was like, yes, this is exactly what I need right now. The intake, you have to be very judicious with it and kind of like... Or at least I should say I do. There's some people who, George and I have talked about this a lot, where she's like, it actually makes my anxiety go away. I don't know why I feel like a freak because of it or whatever. I think our audience in the very beginning, they were using it the same way and they finally got to say, that's what I do too. So when you and your co-host Georgia started the podcast, who were you making it for? I mean, mostly each other, I think. <laughs> like, <laughs> when we had our first conversation and were so into it, and it was such a fun, exciting conversation. And the next time we hung out, we basically did the same thing again. It, it felt like we didn't have enough breath in our lungs. You know what I mean? It was just like, what about the thing? And the this, and, you know, that kind of, <laughs> yes. what is it? You know, she was like, I think this could be a podcast. I didn't see podcasting as any kind of like way to make a living. It was just, oh, we enjoy this 
topic so much and it seems to be coming up more and more. It seems to be getting really popular. Like for a while there, there were just endless series that were like, this is the best true crime story. You won't believe this. You won't believe this. So like there seemed to be tons to talk about. But in the beginning, I honestly thought we were just going to be able to have conversations. Yeah. And then we very quickly realized, oh, we need facts. <laughs> we need to be telling the story accurately. I mean, it sounds kind of sad to say that now, but honestly... I remember the, like one of the first times we tried to do it, I tried to just kind of talk through what I remembered from seeing it on TV. And I remember we, we definitely got some negative feedback on that where people are just like, yeah, you have to get the story right. And then I realized, <laughs> oh, people are actually listening and we're new to this area that has been here for a long time. So somewhere between the internet culture and a cease and desist letter that you were like, I should probably... Get my facts straight because this community is passionate. Because it's about real people. When you act like you're a tourist, that's fine to do privately if you're like, oh, yeah. this is party conversation. But when you actually decide to record yourself and have this conversation and then put it out for other people to hear, you're basically saying we're in this community too. So that's when you very quickly go, this is a real person. They have a family. There are people's lives who are deeply affected and deeply traumatized by a terrible murder. This isn't party talk. This is something that is much bigger and heavier and needs to be treated with respect. And I feel embarrassed to say that my framework on that was not like that when we started because my framework was, oh my God, John Wayne Gacy, what did he do? You know, it was very much like this gaping bystander. Luckily, we had enough goodwill that we got to kind of tighten up our act as we continue to do. I think there's also, though, a recognition, and Gillian Flynn says this, where you're consuming people's tragedy for entertainment. No matter what, a magazine article, even if its ambition is to solve a crime, it's fundamentally to be consumed as a form of entertainment. And your podcast recognizes that in a way that none other has, where it finds humor in these tropes. How do you reconcile that? Because the podcast is still funny and it's still about murder. So what's the two beats of the line of description of how you explain that to people who may not understand that? This is not a celebration of murder. What it is is saying, we know you're reading these books. We know you're reading these magazine articles. We know you're watching Forensic Files. And we know you've been watching it probably by yourself. It actually isn't a new phenomenon in any way. Yeah. Reading about murder has been a lot of people's interest. I mean, that's like broadsheets from the 1700s, 1800s. It's not new. So I think we kind of brought to it as, if you're going to talk about it, we might as well all be together and just be upfront that this is something that we obsess on, that we pay attention to, that we care about, that scares us, but we're still attracted to it. And I think the reason it's predominantly a female audience is because you go, wait, that can happen. That's a possibility. I've never heard of that before. And then you kind of go, what else don't I know? And so there's definitely a self-interest in, I need to educate myself about these terrible things that happen in the world so I can be prepared in case some strange situation happens, like let's run scenarios type of thing. But there's definitely a salaciousness that this can be presented with. We've talked about that before, the reenactments where there's always a really hot blonde in a red bra and the reenactment goes on forever. Yeah. And I remember watching those as like a teenager and being really bummed out by it because it's like, I know what it means when you say someone broke into her bedroom and stabbed her. I don't need to see it in slow motion. I don't need to see a half naked girl. Like there's definitely lots of things in the true crime genre on the whole that have been mishandled. But I think it's developed also, especially recently, it's developed very fast where it's almost like a lot of women have gone, yeah, I pay attention to this. I care about it and I want to talk about the person that got lost or the family that then started a foundation or a survivor, like those survivor stories that make people go, yeah, a lot of people have gone through horrible things and get through them. There's so many more aspects to it than just that 90s way of presenting it. So I think that was also the feel that we had too, where it's like, what if we had a voice in this thing that we've been having presented to us? I don't know if you've connected with or have spoken to or will have an opportunity to connect with the survivors 
of the East Area Rapist. They are featured in the documentary. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had conversations with survivors, be it this case or another case, that have listened to the podcast and seen and connected to you guys in a way that you didn't expect? Yes. It's my favorite story, actually, because in the first year of doing the podcast, I also had a full-time writing job the entire time. So I would basically usually show up at Georgia's house and we would record at eight or nine o'clock at night after I had already put in a full day of work. So there were times where my story, I would basically just watch an episode of the television show I survived and I would retell people's survival stories. It was very lazy, but that was something I would do. And I realized it was because as many stories as we tell that are these awful stories of murder victims, there's also just as many amazing stories about like serial killers who kill, you know, seven women and the eighth one gets away. And that's why we know this guy existed in the first place. And so let's actually, instead of telling the story as if it's about him, we're telling story about that eighth victim that got away and what a badass she was and basically kind of just like reframing the whole thing. So one of those stories is a woman named Jennifer Mori, and she is a lawyer. And she lives in Texas, and she was basically woke up in the middle of the night. She was being attacked. She got into the bathroom, called 911, and she's talking to the 911 operator, and then there's a knock at her front door. It's the security, because she lived in a very high-security apartment complex. The 911 um, dispatcher said, do not open that door. He bangs on the door and bangs on the door. She won't open it. He goes away. She gets taken to the hospital. She survives because it's an I survived story. Then that security guard that had knocked on her door was taking the police around to show them where he thinks. And suddenly one of the cops sees blood on that guy's socks. They make him take his shirt off. His chest is covered in blood. He was the fucking attacker. So that's her story I told on the show. Then about a month later, we get an email from her. And I was like, I can't look at it. If she's upset, it'll destroy me. So she was like, she basically wrote and said, my friend told me she heard this. I was afraid to listen to it. And I was really worried. And I want to thank you because you really told my story well. Then later that year, we went on tour. We invited her to the show. And then she came backstage to meet us. And we said, do you want to come out after so people can see you and meet you? And she was like, uh, okay. The audience goes, bananas. It wow. was Beatles level. And then she proceeds to give them this talk about being survivors. Like, it's going to make me cry. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever been a part of. What did she say? She basically said, you can live through anything. You can make it through anything. We are all strong. Like, we are, you know, women are strong naturally, and we don't know how strong we are until we're tested, and then we know, and it, it's like, don't fear challenges, and don't fear negative things being in your life, because that's when you get stronger. And audience was crying. We were crying. She was crying. It was gorgeous. There's something really nice about that almost to end on in this conversation that we have focused so much about this slow, trudging, mountainous, craggy walk up to how we get to the Golden State Killer yeah. and someone whom we both really loved and admired being sort of leading it and being pulled along by it. And then to remember that for all that trauma, the survivor is on the other side being like, you know, you can get through this. It's not saying that you immediately thrive and everything's fine and you brush it off. It's saying that through a process, you can come out even stronger. You know, being able to maybe pull that out when we're not focusing on the other stuff so much to be able to pull that resilience piece out. Oh, Karen, I so appreciate this conversation. I've been looking forward to it. Great to meet you. Thank you. And I'm glad to share meet someone who also shared the same um, admiration for Michelle. Yeah, me too. That's it for this episode. Many thanks to Liz Garbus, Elizabeth Wolf, and Karen Kilgariff for joining us. And thanks to everyone listening at home. We'll be back next week with retired Detective Carol Daly and Sheriff Kim Stewart to talk about how law enforcement handled and mishandled the Golden State Killer investigation. They'll also talk about what it was like to be a woman on the force working these cases surrounded by men. You can listen to that episode right after the third installment of All Be Gone in the Dark, which premieres next Sunday, July 12th at 10 p.m. Eastern on HBO. I'm Nancy Miller. 
This podcast was produced by HBO in conjunction with Pineapple Street Studios. Our team at Pineapple Street Studios includes executive producers Jenna Weiss Berman, Max Linsky, and Barry Finkel. Our managing producer is Gabrielle Lewis. This episode's lead producer is Emmanuel Hapsis. Our associate producer is Janelle Anderson. Our researcher is Melissa Slaughter. And our editors are Maddie Sprunkheiser and Joel Lovell. Our engineer is Noriko Akabe. Original music by Andrew Epen of Basement Crafts. And special thanks to Liz Garbus, Elizabeth Wolf, and Kate Berry, and everyone else at Story Syndicate. This podcast couldn't exist without you. If you like the show and you have a minute, you can review and rate this podcast via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you might get your podcasts. It really helps people find the show. You can also stream it on HBO and HBO Max. Until next week. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, you can get help by calling the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, or RAIN. You can call their 24-hour hotline at 800-656-HOPE-HOPE, or visit hbo.com slash gone for more resources.